Another Starship flight is right around the corner. How to make space telescopes insanely thin, a black hole feeding faster than it should, and plans to build your own radio telescope. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. Well, hi everybody. Welcome to another episode of Space Bites. As you can tell, I am not in my studio. I am outside here on the rainy, wet coast of Canada. Uh, we are putting in a new uh, power backup system for my studio, and that means there's no power in the entire place, and so I can't be there. So I, the show must go on. All right, so first up, let's talk about plans for another upcoming Starship Super Heavy test flight. So the last one we saw, we saw Super Heavy Starship take off. We saw them separate. Super Heavy did the amazing feat of returning back to the launch gantry and being caught by the chopstick arms of Mechazilla safely, which we learned was actually kind of close. It was sort of dicey whether or not it was actually going to make that. Then Starship flew on a ballistic trajectory and then re-entered the atmosphere over the Indian Ocean. And we saw that, in fact, they had a buoy placed out in the Indian Ocean. They knew exactly where it was going to land, and we saw it come down at the right place. Now, we weren't entirely sure how much more damage was done to the heat shields compared to the previous test, but, you know, it wasn't catastrophic. It definitely got to where it was supposed to go, but we could see there was some damage burning through. So there's a lot of tweaks and fixes that SpaceX is looking to make for this next round of tests. So we got an announcement this week from SpaceX saying that they're targeting their next test flight, that'll be IFT-6, for Starship and Super Heavy no earlier than November 18th. And so the plan this time is to do the same catch of the booster back at the launch site, the same detachment of Starship to head off into space, and the same re-entry into the Indian Ocean. But the additional step they're going to do this time is they're going to attempt to relight the Raptor engines while Starship is above the atmosphere. And this is really important because if they want to move Starship to orbital flights, they need to be able to demonstrate that they can turn the Raptor engines back on. Because once you're in orbit, the only way for you to be able to deorbit in the place of your choosing is to fire your engines, do a deorbit burn, and then re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. So they're going to simulate that, do their, their fire of the Raptor engines, and then they're going to still re-enter it around the same spot in the Indian Ocean. They've also made a bunch of improvements to the heat shielding, and so the hope is to see whether or not the spacecraft can actually handle that re-entry and take even less damage than it did on the previous flight. And then they're gonna make a few more changes on the ground site. One of the things they want to improve is how quickly they can get the propellants off Super Heavy once it lands at Mechazilla. So they're gonna test that out as well. And then they also hinted at a seventh flight, which will come who knows how quickly afterwards. And in that, they're going to test more ideas for the heat shielding, more ideas for how they're going to improve propellant transfer. And that should lead into 2025 when we see that first orbital flight of Starship and then the deorbit burn for it to return back to the launch facility at Boca Chica. So the to-do list is still long, getting shorter, but you know, between now and when Artemis 3 requires the human landing system at the moon, there's a lot of things for SpaceX to still get through to meet those deadlines. A satellite survives an orbital hit. Now, we always talk about the impact of space debris, pardon the pun, and now we have a report from a spacecraft that lived to tell the tale. The satellite is called MP42, and it comes from a company called Nanoavionics. And it was launched back in 2022 as part of the Space Transporter 4 from SpaceX. This is where they just put a whole bunch of small satellites into one SpaceX mission, launched them all together, and deployed them. And according to the company, the spacecraft was hit by a chunk of space debris fairly recently. Now, it hit one of their solar panels, knocked a six millimeter hole in the solar panel, which is about the size of a chickpea, and they actually didn't notice. They didn't see any drop in the amount of power that was coming from the solar panel, but they took a selfie from the spacecraft and noticed that there was this divot taken out of the solar panel. Now, this is just like more evidence of this ongoing problem that is continuing to grow. And, you know, we don't hear a lot of catastrophic damage to satellites from space debris, but as more and more spacecraft go up, as more and more of them end their lives, as more and more of them break apart, then we're going to see more debris and it will grow into the millions of pieces of debris up there. And eventually we will see more catastrophic collisions. And what's interesting is the European Space Agency is planning a new initiative, which they call the zero space debris. And this is a way that every spacecraft that gets launched has some way to deorbit itself before the end of its life so that it doesn't leave any debris after it's gone. 
and they're hoping to sort of reach that first milestone in 2030. So hopefully this time when there was a lot of space debris, when spacecraft could be hit by this stuff, this is just like a phase that humanity is going through. A new way to make space telescopes. Now, as we saw with James Webb, there is only so big you can make a space telescope and pack it into the traditional rocket ferry. James Webb is a 6.5 meter primary mirror and it was stuffed origami style into a five meter Ariane 5 fairing. But we want our telescopes to be bigger, much bigger. And so the way that we're gonna have to be able to do that is figure out new ways to stuff large telescopes, flexible telescopes into very small fairings. And so a new paper came out that caught my eye and this was a proposal for a membrane telescope that could be launched inside a fairing and it would be a very, very thin mirror that is on like a flexible membrane. Then this thing would be stuffed in to a rocket fairing and then when it goes to space, the thing will unfold into like a full shape. It could be a circle, it could be a triangle, whatever. Now the key is how do you focus this enormous floppy telescope in space? And the idea is genius. What they propose to do is use a technique that's very similar to adaptive optics, which is used here on Earth, where you've got a main telescope mirror, you have pistons that are either behind the main mirror or behind the secondary mirror, and they are warping the shape of the mirror so that you're adapting to the amount of atmosphere that's in between you and the target that you're looking at. And this is done, can be done hundreds of times a second, and it allows really ground-based telescopes to act as if they're space-based telescopes. And so, Imagine if you had this mirror out in space and then you fire lasers at the mirror. And then as the lasers bounce off of the mirror, they give it a tiny kick in the opposite direction that will allow you to deform the shape of this floating mirror in space. And so you've got the lasers behind that are firing at the mirror that are deforming it in space. And then you've got your sensors and instruments on the other side, which are detecting the light that is being bounced off of the mirror to form an image and also providing the feedback back to the lasers so that it can continue to sort of fine tune its, its aiming. And so it would be a very bizarre looking telescope and yet in theory it would allow you to have telescopes that are tens of meters, hundreds of meters across that are free floating where their shape is just being controlled by lasers. It's such a clever idea. Now I'm going to be interviewing the researcher behind this idea and so expect to see that interview here on the channel. Uh, within the coming weeks. The aftermath of a neutron star collision. Neutron stars are some of the most extreme objects in the universe. Imagine you've got an object that is several times the mass of the sun that is packed down into an object that is about 20 kilometers across. They are extremely dense. And we know that these objects can collide with one another and the resulting explosion debris field, again, just sort of defies comprehension about what's going on there. What's interesting is you get an environment that is surprisingly similar to what we had in the early universe shortly after the Big Bang. And it comes down to plasma. So when you heat material up, you get a separation between the ions and their electrons. And then only when things sufficiently cool down will you get these things turning into atoms. Within the first few minutes after the Big Bang, you had conditions that were so hot that you had nucleosynthesis. You had ions being turned into heavier elements. You got helium, you could get beryllium, other things like that. And with neutron stars, you've got this cloud of plasma and nucleosynthesis that is creating much heavier elements. You've got gold and plutonium and other things. And in fact, the energy that is given off by this kilonova, by these colliding neutron stars, is coming from just all of these elements that are being formed, that are decaying, and just releasing enormous amounts of energy into space. And so you've got similar conditions in the collisions between neutron stars. You have enormous amounts of energy that are superheating material. You've got elements being formed that are ionized. It's not exactly the same, but the way things decay and the way they evolve over time is really interesting. And so researchers have been studying the aftermath of the Kilanova explosion that happened in 2017, and then comparing the kinds of rates of, of element formation to what's estimated to be back when the Big Bang happened. And they f are finding a lot of really interesting things that they can learn between these two moments, although they're you know, dramatically different in when they happen in the universe and sort of what was the underlying process that led them to happen. Webb reveals a steam world. 
James Webb has been analyzing the atmospheres of many planets and you know we now have an insight into what is surrounding these planets. It's better than anything that's ever come before. We found planets with carbon dioxide and methane and other chemicals as well as water vapor, but now it looks like astronomers have found a world where its atmosphere is almost entirely water vapor, or more specifically, steam. The planet is twice as large as Earth, it has three times the Earth's mass, and it looks like its entire atmosphere is water vapor, and then surrounding a more metallic center. And you know, this planet is classified in the sub-Neptune category. Now, even though we've got water vapor on this planet, it is not habitable. I mean, it is considered a steam world, and to imagine if you wanted to survive in a steam world. But what is really interesting is that you can imagine at higher elevations, that steam is gonna be cooler and cooler, and eventually it's just gonna be water vapor that is actually a more reasonable temperature. And when people consider the habitability of a place like Venus, which, you know, is incredibly hot down low, but maybe has more reasonable temperatures up high, and you've got, sulfuric acid, where life is trying to figure out a way to be able to use sulfuric acid, it seems like it's a lot simpler if you've got heavier elements as well as water vapor for life to be able to try and find a way. And so maybe not habitable down on the surface, but it could be habitable higher up in the atmosphere. Now, this is just a short version. Anton Petrov did an amazing video about this world. You should definitely check out his video. Every week we do a vote on our channel where you tell us what you thought was the best story of the week. And the winner this week was the possibility of a subsurface ocean around Uranus's moon Miranda. So thank you everybody who voted in the poll this week. We post the new poll to our community tab within a few hours of when we release the video. You can go and vote for it there. Or if you're just scrolling on YouTube and you'll see our poll and just make a choice and that will train the algorithm that you wanna see more of these in the future. Now, of course, you should be subscribed to our channel, click on the notifications bell to maximize the chance of seeing the boat. A black hole is feasting too quickly. One big mystery in astronomy is how we've got supermassive black holes that got so big so early. I mean, less than a billion years after the Big Bang, we are seeing black holes with hundreds of millions of times the mass of the sun. And recently, astronomers found an example of a black hole that appears to be violating the laws of physics about how quickly it is consuming material. Now, that would help answer how these black holes get so big so early because maybe they're actually able to feed a lot more quickly than astronomers ever thought. Now, the theoretical limit that black holes should be able to consume material is known as the Eddington limit. And researchers have found an example of a black hole, which has been designated LID 568, that appears to have recently put on mass 40 times faster than the Eddington limit. So how did they find this? They used James Webb, of course, and they were able to measure this jet that is coming off of the black hole that is moving out into space. They're able to measure the amount of material that's in the jet and the speed that the jet is going away from where the black hole is. And then from there, they were able to calculate how much material the black hole must have ingested to produce a jet like this. So how, how is this possible? I mean, researchers don't know. I mean, maybe there's a measurement error. Maybe there's a mechanism the black holes use to be able to feed on material more quickly. So we're gonna have to wait and find out. Now, again, I've queued up an interview with the researchers behind this research. And so hopefully we'll be showing that in a couple of weeks. Pour one out for the Skylon. I've talked quite a lot about the Skylon space plane. That's because it's a really exciting idea. Imagine if you had this thing that looked like an airplane, you could put a cargo on it, it would take off from a runway, fly up to orbit, release its payload, return through the atmosphere, land on a runway, and you wouldn't have to throw away any part of the vehicle. That's exciting. Now, the problem with building a single stage to orbit vehicle is that the kind of engine that you need at different altitudes changes. So if you're gonna be in low altitude, the way, say, airplanes fly, well, then you can bring in your oxidizer from the atmosphere itself and you don't need to carry the oxidizer. This is how jet engines work, right? They carry fuel, but they don't need to carry the oxidizer. But once you get above the atmosphere, you can no longer bring in atmosphere as your oxidizer. You need to carry it on board. And that's why rockets have, say, hydrogen and oxygen. They have their propellant and the oxidizer. And so the Skylon was designed to use this really interesting rocket engine called Sabre. And so Sabre is the synergetic air breathing rocket engine. And the engine would work like a jet engine at lower altitudes. And then as the rocket plane got to a high enough altitude, 
it would switch over and behave more like a rocket. And so you wouldn't have to have two separate propulsion systems just to be able to get you to orbit. The company that designed this concept has been working on it for 25 years and they've gone through many rounds of funding. They've had won various prizes. They've gotten partnerships with space agencies. And we learned this week that they've run out of money. Now they tried to bring in one final investing round of $25 million to keep them going. That fell through. And so now they've had to lay off almost their entire staff and they're going into receivership. So does that mean that the idea is dead? Uh, who knows? I mean, someone is going to pick up the parts and the pieces they are going to buy the design for the Sabre engine and maybe they'll continue to develop it. Or it might just be that nobody wants to be able to continue investing this as we see fully reusable two-seed rockets coming out of places like SpaceX. So still, you know, a lot of people were really excited about this idea and now it looks like it may not happen. You can build a radio telescope at home. All right, do you want a fun home project? What about building your own radio telescope capable of seeing the clouds of neutral hydrogen here in the Milky Way? So we've got a new paper that we're reporting on at Universe Today where someone gives you the design for building a radio telescope out of a one meter satellite radio dish, as well as a Raspberry Pi and a bunch of custom software. And what this does, it's designed to tune the telescope. And then if you tune the telescope to a frequency of 1420.405 megahertz, that is known as the 21 centimeter line of neutral hydrogen. So when you have large clouds of hydrogen just sitting there, not turning into a star, not doing anything, Sometimes the hydrogen will get what's called a spin flip of its electron and that will release a photon in this very specific wavelength. And so this is the way that astronomers map out the clouds of hydrogen that are in the Milky Way, as well as the clouds of hydrogen that are in galaxies a long time ago. They measure the emission of this very specific wavelength and then they see the redshift and that tells them how far away this galaxy is where these clouds of hydrogen are and hopefully future versions of these radio telescopes will be able to measure this neutral hydrogen early on in the universe, like after the Big Bang, during the dark ages, when really the only radiation that was getting out was this 21 centimeter line and then heavily redshifted. So if you want a radio telescope, and you can also point it at the sun, you can detect bright pulsars and things like that. But if you want a cool project, build your own radio telescope. Now, while you're watching this week's episode of Space Bites, I am writing my weekly guide to space. This is the weekly email newsletter that I write. That I send out to 70,000 of my closest friends, it includes dozens of space stories that you're not seeing here on Space Bites and really anywhere else on the internet. For example, a new detailed report tells you exactly what happened to the Arecibo Observatory. Another way to extract energy from black holes. And now we can see plastic waste on the beaches from space. So my weekly email newsletter guide to space comes out every Friday. I write every word. There's no ads. It's completely free. You can unsubscribe anytime you like. Go to universetoday.com slash newsletter to sign up. Now I'm going to talk about a way that you can ask your questions to some of the researchers that I'm going to be talking to. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Adam Schaefer, Barry Lake Roofing, David Gilton, and David Matz, Dennis Alberti, Dustin Cable, Jeremy Matter, and Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Paul Rohrbach, scienceworldrecord.org, spiderswap.io, Stephen Krasaki, Stephen Farnley-Munley, and Vlad Shiplin, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other supporters on Patreon. So a lot of the times when I complete my interviews, it's sort of a fait accompli. Uh, by the way, we've got a new interview with a researcher, but you know, a lot of the times people have questions and questions that I didn't even think of. And so we're going to try a new idea on the channel and we are going to ask the patrons, both the paid and the free patrons, if they have any questions for the researchers. And so by the time you watch this video, I will have posted this request from the patrons, which you can go and be a part of this. If you just go to patreon.com slash universe today and click the free button to follow us. You'll see all of the topics that I'm going to be interviewing and then you can post a question to one or some of the researchers. And then when I go to do my interview, I will grab a couple of those questions and give credit to the people who suggested them when I talk to the researchers. So go and check that out. Patreon.com slash universe today. All right. We will see you next week back in my studio.